Welcome to the January 11th, 2011 Hudson Board of Education meeting. Please stand as you're able and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, board members, you have the agenda for this evening in front of you. Um, is there a motion to accept the agenda? Madam President, I move to approve the agenda. Second. Motion by Lynn, second by Dan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So we're moving smartly into student staff community recognition, student to student, Corey McIntyre. Thank you, board members. Tonight, it's my pleasure to update you on our student-to-student -student program at Hudson High School. The student-to-student -student program is a, a program that pairs junior and senior mentors with students with disabilities in effort to provide them with peer support. And the group typically meets one time during the month for a social event. And um, if you didn't uh, know, last month in December, there was a uh, article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press acknowledging the work being done in our student-to-student -student program. So. We were pleased to see that kind of acknowledgement. Tonight we have uh, John Dornfeld here, with a school counselor from Hudson High School, along with a student, Ben Peters. Some of you remember Ben. And uh, they're here tonight to share with us more information about the student to student program. So Mr. Dornfield. Thanks for having us. Um, I don't know if Nancy can remember um, as clearly as I do, but several years ago, um, how the program had started, we had a, a group, uh, the National Honor Society at the high school, who had on a particular spring as one of their service projects and an activity for their kids to be involved in had provided um, escorts for some of our students with disabilities for the prom and it was just a, it was just a really neat experience to watch and, and, and we, it just got us kind of thinking is why is that something that we do just once a year maybe that's something that we could expand to, to some type of regular activity and um, I'd actually approached Nancy about it and Nancy had thought it was a good idea and she had suggested that uh, there were a couple of uh, adults from the, the Bridge for Youth with Disabilities in town, Peg Gagnon and Margie Miller, and she had suggested that maybe I touch base with them and maybe team with them on the project. And, and we did do that and went through some, some planning stages, but the first year we had about 50 kids that volunteered, 50 juniors and seniors, um, did things like uh, went to a Twins game, uh, went to the homecoming football game, went to a basketball game, choir concert, play, um, Valley Fair at the end of the year, and it was, and it was just amazing really how easy it was once we, once we got it going. Um, and it was, we'd get, we'd get done with an event and we'd go, you know, that was really easy and that worked again. And, and it didn't seem to matter what we did as long as we had our mentors there and we had the students, it, things just went well. Um, and through the six years though, it's expanded from 50 kids this year we had 130 mentors that signed up to be a part of it, and which is, which is kind of a, a good news, bad news thing. It, it gets a little bit difficult to, to try to coordinate that, a program of that size, um, but it, it just speaks so highly of our kids that, that they want to be in that position to help those kids. So, um, and again, we've, we've, we've done a variety of things. Probably the highlight for the year is, is the one that's coming up this coming, sun, this coming Saturday at one o'clock in the auditorium, we're having a variety show. And if you don't have anything going, encourage you to come because I guarantee you'll leave with a smile on your face and it's a, it's a lot of fun. So um, I think though probably best to maybe turn it over to Ben Peters who's um, kind of become through process of elimination kind of the group spokesperson was the person that was interviewed for the St. Paul Pioneer Press and I, I know he's a, a kind of a regular at these meetings so I'll let him <laughs> take his turn. So thank you for having us here though. <laughs> Everyone again. Um, just I uh, want to talk about my experience with STS. Uh, I joined my, my junior year, which was last year, and um, the reason why I joined was, re wasn't really by so recommendation of upperclassmen. It was seeing the interaction in the hallways with uh, students who are, are life assistants in the special education rooms. And um, just seeing their interaction, like always having a smile on their face, interacting with you know, all the kids in the special ed rooms, it was just like, you know what, I want to be a part of that. And, um, I joined my junior year, uh, had a really great time, you know, met some really good friends and, uh, you know, it was really good. But I just kind of, it's really built up for me in my senior year. 
Um, I've had the opportunity to help out with some, like organize some of the events and whatnot. And um, I've really developed a really good friendship with a lot of my buddies. And uh, to the point where uh, today I was at, I was in a different lunch. We have three lunches and I went to a different one because I had to make up a test. And uh, one of uh, my buddies, Kevin, and then Dan just grabbed me and like, hey, you're eating lunch with us today. And so, you know, I was sitting there, I was planning on studying my AP Psych, but no, I just, uh, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> ended up eating lunch with Dan and Kevin, and Kevin informed me that I was singing Justin Bieber with him at the variety show this weekend, <laughs> whether I liked it or not. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just been a really great experience for me. And uh, this week, I've also had the opportunity to speak to a lot of FYI, freshman year initiative, um, it's a freshman only class and they just kind of work on, you know, everything in school and senior mentors uh, had some people go and speak there and they always, one of the frequent questions that, you know, what are groups that you recommend? Because we said, hey, you should get involved in school. And I said, STS is probably the club that's touched me the most in my entire high school, even though it's only been for two years. Because um, I know Mr. Dornfeld and Ms. Jameson have always said, you know, you make they have such a great impact, we have such a great impact on our buddies, but the impact they have on us is probably the greatest of both. And, um, you know, it's touched me so much that next semester I'm going to be a, a life assistant in the, in the rooms. And there's, it's probably the class I'm looking forward to most in my schedule next semester. So it's been a really great opportunity and it's awesome to see it grow. And I've probably made some of the best friends out of my buddies that, I, that I'll ever have. So let's thank you for letting us have it. Thank you, Ben. Two things to add. Um, one is, first of all, that the kids do just a tremendous job, and Ben's been just such a good leader with it. But I also want to mention the other advisors, Sarah Jamison, one of the counselors at the high school, and Stacy Tiedemann. And honestly, Stacy, who is the secretary in the counseling office, probably does 90% of the work in terms of setting things up um, from month to month and getting the activities going. So I want to make sure that she gets recognized for what she does. So thank you. Can Perhaps if you want to um, stick around or stick close, gentlemen, if there is anyone, anyone from the board have a question for either of these two? No? Uh, Can well, I just well, make one more comment? Just another indicator of the success of this program is that we routinely get calls from other districts asking about this. And, and the article in the St. Paul Pioneer Press led to a few more calls as well. So when others are seeking us out asking for how do you do this, uh, the quality speaks for itself. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, just a couple of things. Um, ben, thank you very much, really, for sharing that story. It's great to hear. And Mr. Dornfeld, I remember vividly the story in the Hudson paper six years ago when you did that first prom um, escort. And so it's, it's, it, it's great to hear how that has evolved over the last six years. So thank you both, actually. Great. Thank you. Okay, next on our list is Student Leadership, SADD and Youth Court, Sandy. Thank you. We are pleased this evening to recognize a relatively new program, but a prime example, again, of just the leadership that our students are exhibiting at the high school. So I'm going to ask Callie Aline, Brooke Brokaw, and Hannah Montgomery to step forward. This is a joint project between the Youth Court and the peers there, SAD, and our local law enforcement. You saw, I think, Chief Jensen in the audience as well, and that's why he's here to show his support as well. But uh, I know these ladies are going to explain how this has evolved and also their big plans for the future. Hi, um, my name is Brooke Broca. I am a junior at Hudson High School, and I have been involved with St. Croix Valley Youth Court since 2005. And we just want to thank you for letting us speak to you tonight. So the St. Croix Valley Youth Court um, joined this program to help increase awareness about the dangers of distracted driving. Many people have cell phones and don't hesitate to use their phone to make a phone call while they are behind the wheel. This is a distraction that is dangerous. If you are taking your eyes off the road, taking your hands off the wheel, or taking your mind off what you are doing, you are distracted. This is dangerous and puts us all at risk. We have partnered with CARE 11, Youth Action Hudson, SAD, and the Hudson and North Hudson Police Departments on Hang Up and Drive, a campaign to eliminate distracted driving. We kicked the campaign off in Hudson at the last home football game and have, and have been attending community events and doing presentations in classes at the Hudson High School. Our goals include in expanding the campaign into St. Croix County, Wisconsin, and possibly the nation. 
Pledge forms and window clings are available at Sylvan Learning Center, Youth Action Hudson, Hudson Police Station, and community events. And since St. Croix Valley Youth Court has taken this as our service project, um, CARE 11 has given away over 20,000 pledge forms and window clings. And before um, Youth Court got involved with it, there really, there was awareness about it, but not that many people were interested in learning more. So we thought that 20,000 was, wow, that many people are interested in not using their cell phone while they're driving. So this is the pledge form that we've been asking people to sign. And since um, we got involved with it, over 500 people have signed it from Hudson. And this is also the pledge form that, or the window cling that we've been giving away that we ask people to put in their windows, not only to remind them of the dangers of distracted driving, but also people passing by to let them know how, did it, how dangerous it is too. Um, recently, as of December of last year, all drivers have been banned from texting and driving in Wisconsin. In Minnesota, cell phones are banned for permanent and intermediate license holders during the first 12 months after licensing. No one may text, message, email, or access the web on a wireless device while driving, including while stopping in traffic on any Minnesota road. So it's really a really dangerous uh, risk you're taking when you're texting and driving because an estimated 67% of Wisconsin drivers ages 16 to 19 that are killed in car crashes, the fatal cra crash is their first and last crash. And this was an article that Rayla Hood, the Secretary of U.S. Transportation, featured um, our work, and this was sent over to a million people to look at. So we thought that was really cool that he would take our little, well not little town of Hudson and feature such a huge article about what we're doing. Um, nearly 6,000 people died in 2008 in crashes involving a distracted driver and more than half a million were injured. The younger, unexperienced drivers that we're reaching out to with our program are under 20 years old have the highest chances of getting in a distracted late related fatal crash. Drivers who use handheld devices are four times as likely to get in crashes and seriously injure themselves. Using a cell phone while driving, whether it's handheld or hands-free, delays the driver's reactions as much as a blood alcohol concentration of 0.8%. Hi, I'm Hannah from Hudson High School. I'm a senior and I'm the vice president of SAD. And what we did was we just wanted to partner with them to do a campaign that we can really relate to and know a lot about instead of just like passing on information to them. We can really like talk to them about it because we deal with it, stuff like that every day. So. I wanna, I wanna thank you for allowing these uh, very vibrant young people to get up here and, and talk to you today. Um, we are very proud to be a part of this uh, campaign that's going on right now. It's nice to see young people like this coming out and pushing this campaign about distracted driving. Over the last three years in the city of Hudson, over just over 12% of all our accidents, we can tie to inattentive driving. It could be anything from a cell phone to reaching down to change the radio or something along those lines. So distracted driving is very, very serious matter to us in the law enforcement field. And it's nice to see the young kids coming out, especially with the young drivers going out on the road without that experience to be able to drive. Now, not being able to use their cell phone, I know, is a very touchy subject. They want to be on that thing all the time. They want to be texting. They want to be you know, talking to their friends. But this is encouraging to see these young kids come out here and say, you know what? You got to concentrate on what you're doing, concentrate on the road. If you got to talk on your phone, pull over and, and do it that way. So we're very proud to be part of this young organization that's going on here and we hope that you'll sign those pledge forms and be part of our organization to help pass this message along. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. You know, it's great to see such student leadership in an initiative like this. 
and uh, we're really proud of your efforts. So thanks, thanks for being leaders, uh, student leaders for our community. All right, um, and last in this section of the agenda, Sandy, um, Project Lead the Way, National Certification. All right, and I'm gonna ask Melissa Hansen, School to Career Coordinator, to come up and join me. We're gonna kind of a joint announcement here. We'll just read the first line of the letter that just arrived uh, last week from the National PLTW saying, congratulations, Hudson Senior High School is now a Project Lead the Way certified school. As a result of this certification, your PLTW students are now eligible to apply for transcripted college credit for their high school PLTW courses. And we just want to share that wonderful news with you. As you know, just last fall, we started Project Lead the Way in the high school with the first course, Intro to Engineering Design, with Dan Wayland as the instructor. This year, we added Principles of Engineering um, and also then trained Derek Shaka, who is doing the intro while Dan takes on sections of the principles of engineering and in just over a year we were able then to bring in reviewers we had two reviewers here for a day they interviewed students parents business representatives from the area Melissa administrators at the high school district administrators they wanted to make sure they observed classrooms they wanted to make sure that we had all of the requirements in order to earn that that uh, national certification. And at the end of the day, they came up with several pages of both some highlights and things that, and also suggestions on what we can do. But they were very positive about our ability to secure funding, not only through the Kern Foundation, but that we sought other funding opportunities. They were absolutely, their words were they were blown away by the number of parents we had in the room and that their positive comments. That really tells them that students are going home from class and talking about Project Lead the Way. That's, they were just very excited to see that. They were also complimentary about our classroom setup, that they had the hardware they needed, the software, the materials they needed to run the program. The administrative support, they said, was very obvious. And they just told us to actually do more showing off. Show off what you're doing, it's good stuff. And then they also were complimentary about the fact that we did make the initiative this year to bring the middle school program in because they said that will just absolutely grow your high school program as well. So Melissa was key. She is um, there right at my side as we tried to make sure that we secured funding. She works with Dan and Derek obviously with her role with vo leading vocational education. Um, neither of our instructors could be with us tonight and Laura also has a meeting but just wonderful news. I don't know if you have any more to add. I do, I just wanted to thank you and also to thank Sandy for her work and also to pub publicly acknowledge those business partners that we have. When we began our community partnership team two years ago as a, as a requirement for the grant, we had three participants at our first meeting and three at the second. And just recently in December, we held our, an advisory council meeting and we had 13. So that does show the support from our community. Our business partners were incredibly excited about all the different possibilities of the connect for the connections that they can make with our school. So I'd like to thank them, you and Sandy as well. So thank you. Thanks. So thank you so much for your support. I'd also like to recognize Sandy's leadership. Um, this program to implement takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes a lot of work at the high school, and I know Ed Lucas was part of that, as well as Laura Love carrying it on, Melissa and our teachers, and Sandy working to get um, additional funding through uh, grants has been very, very helpful in implementing this program. So it takes um, a number of people, a team, to, to make this happen for our students. And now because of this national certification, they can actually um, get the, the credit for it. So that's, that's great to know. Madam President, uh, Sandy, just a question regarding where it indicates uh, students are eligible to apply for transcripted college credit based on other schools that have already attained that, are the credits pretty, I just know from experience with my kids, it's a lot of those. Oh, schools, transfers. They don't always transfer to all the different colleges and schools, so how wide, widely accepted is um, it, do you know? We do know, we do have a list, uh, obviously the, mainly within the UW system or within Wisconsin, they transfer in quite easily. 
especially if you're going into anything that involves the sciences, math, and or pre-engineering programs, um, they, they are all readily taking those credits. And actually looking for students who in their like high school careers are even taking the classes, they're even contacting those kids saying, hey, I see you're taking PLTW. You know, we want you here. We want you at this college. Good, thank you. Just adding on to that, um, one of the differences, Dan and board members, is this is a national program that is really endorsed by many of the major universities. So they were part of the initiative that actually supports this, like um, uh, Purdue and the big engineering schools are, are supportive of this. So they not only um, uh, possibly accept the credit, and I don't know s specific schools beyond Wisconsin, uh, but it's highly likely, and it is also uh, scholarships are made available to students who have gone through uh, Project Lead the Way at these engineering schools. Um, I was just going to add a couple of things. One, um, I, you know, we see through the Board of Education agendas often, uh, many of the agenda items address things that highlight where we're moving forward on our um, HSD 2025, and I think this is clearly one of those places. It's a great thing for our students. Um, and I had one question. Melissa, have you figured out where you're going to hang the banner yet? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we are now into the superintendent's report section of the agenda, Mary. And board members, I'd just like to report to you in our community that um, the April 5th election, school board election, the order of the candidates on the ballot will be Jim Kubiak, followed by Lynn Robson, and then Dan Chernohoy. And moving on to the next item under the superintendent's report is open enrollment. Um, open enrollment allows parents to apply uh, for their children to attend school districts other than the one in which they live. And so in Hudson, we have students who uh, want to come into the Hudson School District and attend our schools at all levels. And we also have some students who are interested in attending other schools for specific reasons. The uh, time to apply for open enrollment is February 7th through the 25th, and that is for next year's enrollment. And uh, this is a, a really key uh, time for parents to make application. If they're interested in that, you can't do that at any other time except this window. Uh, Diane has already been fielding lots of questions. We have information available on our website, and we anticipate that the board will be taking action on open enrollment in April. Moving along. All right, last month in December, uh, demographer Dr. Hazel Reinhardt presented enrollment projections for the district through the year to 2020 and 2011. Uh, I'm sorry, not 2011, 202011. Boy, is that a long way out and, and very um, hard to say. So we'll get used to it as time progresses here. But since the projections are impacted by birth rates and migration, which is really students moving into the district schools, um, Dr. Reinhardt broke projections down into four different categories and develop projections for each. And those categories are low kindergarten numbers, so the number of students going into kindergarten, and low migration, those students coming into district schools. That's one category. Another category is low kindergarten and high migration. Um, the next is high kindergarten, so a high number of kindergartners coming in, and low migration. And the last category is high kindergarten and high migration. Uh, the purpose of this report tonight is to compare elementary, middle school, and high school capacity to those enrollment projections. And since the four um, categories really produce a range, we'll look specifically at the lowest and the highest projections, um, and that is the one that's low kindergarten and low migration numbers, and then high kindergarten and high migration numbers. Um, the, two ca uh, the other two categories will fall within these projections. So I know you're all looking at um, what's behind us um, being projected, and so we'll move into elementary uh, capacity and those enrollment projections from Dr. Uh, Reinhardt. 
And I'd like to just talk first about elementary capacity, which is the blue line that you see on the graph. And our total elementary capacity, if we could have students across our district in the right grade levels and at um, the right schools distributed so that we filled the seats that we had, uh, we would have 2,940 seats. Um, we all know that that's not how students come to our schools in even numbers by grade level, certainly, or even numbers by the size of our particular schools. And it fluctuates from years to year, so you do need some level of flexibility. So looking at this graph, um, taking the enrollment capacity, which is the blue line up at the top, and then taking the low projections um, and low kindergarten and low uh, migration, which is the red line, and then the high kindergarten and high migration numbers, which is the green line, we would expect that um, our enrollment would over time fall within that range between the red and the green lines. Um, just as a reminder, our official um, kindergarten through fifth grade enrollment uh, as of September 17th of this school year was 2,578 students. And essentially, if we looked at the capacity, that would mean, um, again, if those students fell in, in uh, exactly the seats that we have and where they are, uh, we would have 362 seats left. And you can see by the graph when you look at it, it looks like, well, over this period of time through 2020, that um, we would have enough room in our elementary schools. So I'd like to look at the chart that falls underneath that um, graph that produces the graph itself. And um, look at the, this, these are the numbers that actually produce the graph we just saw. And so I'd like to concentrate a little bit on the last two columns, the difference between the capacity and the projection. And so you can see the numbers um, of seats that we have available if those students fell within this range. Um, and so it looks like, again, going to 2020, that we have um, very few seats left, but we have seats left. If, if our projections and our actual enrollments over that time period um, were the same. The thing that I would point out um, is that issue of flexibility that you need in your schools because the students don't come in equal numbers based on where we have the seats. So right now, this year, in September, we had 362 seats available across the six elementary schools. And yet, even with that many seats, we've already started to move students around to seats. So when we look at Holton, and you'll remember we had that large kindergarten class across the district. In, at Holton, we were above our class size guidelines. And the next student who came in, we looked at where was space available for that student and um, are transporting the student. So even with 362 seats, uh, we often uh, may have to move students. And we would expect, over time, on these 10-year period, that we would be moving students around. Um, and really, our schools would become full over time. Any questions on elementary? All right, let's move on to middle school. Same kind of information, so the, um, it's easy to understand the graph this time. Um, but a very different picture at the middle school, grades six through eight. You can see the blue line. Uh, our capacity at that school, again, if every seat was filled, would be um, 1125, 1,125 seats. And um, our enrollment, our official enrollment as of September 17th of this year was 1,241 students. And we were already, this year, 116 students over capacity. And I just want to point out, um, I see some middle school teachers here, and they certainly know that we are, have the largest middle school in the state of Wisconsin. And you can see that it continues to um, be over capacity for the entire time uh, through 2020. You, uh, 
I had a question from um, Lynn Robson about you see a downturn for the last uh, couple years in the graph. And uh, what happens there? Why does it turn down and does it continue in that direction? And essentially, if you look back to um, Dr. Reinhardt's report from last um, time, she identified that the births in Hudson, in the Hudson School District, um, decreased in the last few years. And it, it aligns with the recession. It started a year before the recession, but aligned with the recession. And that also aligned with what was seen at the national level as well, that the births, uh, there was a downturn in the births. So as a result of this, if we look at those students coming into our schools, generally in the year 2013-2014, um, and we look at her projections, we start to see that they, she has lowered the, the size of the kindergarten class from the previous year. And so for three years, we're looking at a lower size kindergarten class. And what happens is those students move through the system and in the year 2019-20, they come into the middle school. And so there are less students, a few less students. It's not a big downturn. Um, the, the chart is only 25 students from uh, space to space that you can see. But that downturn comes into the middle school in 2019-20 uh, and then continues for a couple of years, three years, and then the enrollments, um, if you look back at the kindergarten class that corresponds with this, off this chart, so into the future beyond the chart, it starts to go up again. So it, it continues to be above the capacity of the middle school. If we move down to the chart itself, away from the graph, um, these numbers in the last two columns um, are certainly ones for us to have uh, significant concern about knowing that our middle school is already the largest in the state of Wisconsin. And if we go down to the bottom of that chart and we would look at um, enrollment projections and, and, well, actually I'm gonna go to the two columns before. So look at the enrollment projections, the low, low numbers and the high, high numbers in the year 2020. So 1,467 and 1,557. If we would divide those numbers, either one, we would end up with two schools over 700. That falls in the, the average range uh, of a middle school. And so we can see that our numbers are very, very significant. Not only would we have the largest middle school um, and without space for those students, but we would actually be the size of two, two regular size middle schools and actually fairly large size middle schools. Um, again, very significant for us as we look to the future. And um, again, in this chart, if we could extend it down further with the incoming, um, the impact of those incoming kindergarten classes, we would see again an upturn in the numbers. So again, we would be above capacity and certainly something um, that's very important for the board to consider and for us to address as the community to serve these students and invest in their learning and their future. Questions on the middle school? Madam President, I just want to make a comment, Mary, that when you look at um, the 2018-2019 numbers, I mean, the difference number is bigger than our graduating classes are. It's staggering. It's yes. really staggering. Absolutely. Good point. All right, moving on to the high school. Um, again, as we look at this graph, the blue line representing our capacity of 1,680 seats, full seats at the high school. Um, our enrollment as of September 17th was 1,641 students, and that was nearing full capacity of the building. Um, over time, the graph tells the story as those students move through elementary school, and then move into middle school, and then move on to the high school, we have a very significant problem that continues into the future um, for the Hudson School District. 
So um, as Dr. Reinhart pointed out, we have students and families moving into the Hudson School District and be attracted to the Hudson School District because of the quality of our programs. And um, as we look at this, um, you know, when we looked at the bottom of the, the chart itself with the numbers, Diane, if you'd roll up to that or roll down to that, in the year 2020, um, her projections show 431 to 540 students over capacity. Um, certainly, again, uh, very, very significant. And we have high schools in the state of Wisconsin of this size, um, just the number over capacity. So um, very concerning for us. We have a significant problem at our secondary level that is here. It's here at the middle school uh, today. And at the high school, basically, it will be here um, starting next year as we look at um, space and flexibility for space and again serving our students and investing in their future. Uh, in anticipation of considering um, a possible solutions for this overcrowding that we currently have and which will continue to increase at both the middle school and then the high school itself, um, basically our secondary schools. Secondary schools are grade six through 12, both middle school and high school. Um, you will receive a report uh, about the UU property and um, looking at it as a secondary school site um, on our agenda this evening uh, as we look forward to um, starting to work on how to solve this problem of overcrowding that um, is a, a problem that our community needs to tackle. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Madam President, Mary, um, can you speak to how we came up with the building capacities? I, I recall um, several years ago that, you know, we, we looked at that and then we, you know, revisited it mm -hmm. because I think we, I think some members of the public had some questions regarding, you know, were we, you know, were we using the right process or um, in coming up with that number? And it seems like <clears throat> we start out with a lower number then with, you know, some more work working through our administrators, we were able to, you know, improve that number. So do we still feel pretty confident about the capacity level? You have a very good memory. Um, no, Dan, <laughs> uh, prior to my coming, uh, during um, the work of the task force and the work with ATSNR, they developed capacities for our building. And um, then administration reviewed those uh, a few years later. And uh, ATSNR uh, used the class size guidelines and used what's common in the industry um, to give flexibility to our schools, you usually do not make the capacity at 100%. You make it at a lower level. Um, knowing that this, um, the criticism about, from community members about maybe that capacity was too low, the administration essentially said, here's the capacity based on 100% of the seats filled. And so the capacities you see before you are at 100%. There's a problem with that that I pointed out this evening, that our students don't come in the spaces that we may have in the grade level or in the school or whatever it is. So, and that's why generally when you do capacities, you set that at a lower level because of your program at the high school um, and because of the flexibility and fluctuation from year to year. Again, we've set it at 100%, and we've set it at 100% to say here are all the seats that we have, and um, we're not going to argue whether um, it's 85% or 90%. Here are all the seats, 100% of the seats, and that's how we design the capacities that we have currently based on the class size guidelines and the number of classrooms we have. Okay, thank you. Madam uh, President, Mary, uh, just along those lines, do you recall what, because the, there, there was a number given that is sort of, an ideal percentage of capacity. And 85% actually kind of 
sort of rings a bell, but do you remember what that was? I, I don't. I don't. I'd have to go back and okay. look at that report, Mark, but it is is general in the industry um, to be at a percentage as opposed right. to 100%. Right. Okay. Yes. And if you'd like to have that, we can bring that back. Yeah, I'd like just to refresh okay. my memory. I, I sort of, 85% sort of came to mind, but I don't know. I'm just. It's close to that. That's yeah. what I can, yeah. Okay. Thank Madam you. President. Mary, I just also was wondering, does it take into consideration in some of our um, facilities, common area and areas that does it just take into consideration class si the classrooms and whether or not they can hold the students or does it take into consideration the common areas and the ability of those areas to man yeah, manage the students? Um, when looking at our schools, and the schools were all built at different times, um, not all of those facilities have equitable um, common areas because of the, the age of when the building was built. The most significant um, one that we addressed when we uh, determined these new capacities was Holton. Because when we looked at Holton and um, took the number of classrooms and said, if we took our class size guidelines and went up to the capacity of the building based on the classrooms we had, um, we would not be able to support that with the common areas that are currently there. And so as part of our re original report, we said that would need to be addressed at Holton. At the other um, buildings, we have um, some issues, but they're not as significant as Holton. And um, you know, just uh, let's, let's go to the high school. The high school has a very obvious um, common area that's a problem. And that's the hall that connects um, the east and west wing. It is not um, sufficient to take the traffic um, between those two um, wings of the building, the academic wings of the building, um, based on passing time and so forth. So the passing time may be longer because of that, and many of the students go outside as a result. So that's a common area that isn't addressed, that needs to be addressed, and as we get larger, it becomes more of a problem. Um, the middle school, uh, common area that doesn't, it, we're beyond capacity, so I guess uh, looking at the cafeteria and so forth wouldn't be um, an issue just because of capacity. But um, those are those are issues that we do have um, in our like in our buildings. Sure. Thanks, Mary. <coughs> Any other questions from the board? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, <coughs> at the risk of stating the incredibly obvious. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the numbers um, for the second, uh, secondary schools, both the middle high and the senior high, certainly indicate we have a problem and it's getting worse. And even if you looked at Hazel's projections and uh, wanted to argue that she might be aggressive in her growth assumptions and you cut her growth assumptions in half, we still have a problem and it's getting worse. So I think the, the story to, the, to us as board members is um, this, uh, this brings some compel, compelling and urgent information, I think, for us to, to uh, consider in our work. So thank you, Mary. Uh, we are on to the report section of the agenda, and the first item there is the elementary literacy system, Peg Shoemaker and Susie Prather. Welcome. And um, thank you. Um, we, Susie and I represent both learning services and the elementary principals um, as we talk to you about a system transformation in the area of teaching reading. That's certainly something that our district has been engaged in at the elementary level and you have supported us along the way and tonight we're going to show you the whole package and how system transformation really takes place. And um, tonight we're talking specifically about um, guided reading. So if we go on to the next slide, um, you probably can recall the days of when you perhaps learned to read and you may have fallen into one of these categories. Um, during the 1960s um, through the 1980s, there was um, small grouping and uh, I can remember myself being in one of those groups. I was in the high reading group, I must say. But anyway, um, we um, generally those groups were um, um, static. There wasn't a lot of movement within those groups. Um, once you were in a group, you stayed in that group. 
um, and um, a strategy called round robin was when um, one teacher listened to one student while all the rest listened um, to each other read. And generally it was a textbook. Um, sometimes the texts were differentiated um, just by if you were a bluebird or if you were a robin or what other uh, creative ways they came to label reading groups. Then we went completely the opposite way. And that happened um, during the 1980s to 1990s in a movement in reading called um, whole language. Generally, whole language um, was delivered in a whole group. Every student had the same text. Um, it was generally theme-based, and um, it, there, so it completely um, delivered in a whole group format. So the full class read the same exact text for the entire reading part. And then finally, um, is this what we're going to talk about tonight? Um, a little bit is, is the balanced literacy movement. This movement um, gained a lot of notoriety actually in New Zealand initially. Um, it is in um, thousands upon thousands of schools and shows um, great promise uh, in, in um, meeting the needs of individual students. I want to tell you a little bit about how that differs First of all, um, you do have reading groups in, um, in balanced literacy. They're called guided reading, and we're going to look specifically at that component tonight. Uh, generally, it's three to five readers are in a group. They are reading um, texts that are at their level and generally uh, texts that they're interested in reading. The, result, uh, the research about reading shows that students um, are, uh, make st greatest strides when they're reading in text that they can and want to read. So generally, the teacher chooses a text. It's a leveled text. And um, sometimes it's also by st um, skill or strategy. And so that's another way that a, that a teacher groups them. These groups change often, generally every six weeks. Um, and ongoing progress monitoring is implemented to see if students are making growth or not. So it's real books, real real books, um, not not a basal series like um, like we probably saw in the areas of whole language and the Bluebird Robin <laughs> series. But these are real texts that and real books that are are at their particular level. In addition, each student receives individual feedback from from their teacher and goal setting. So you can walk into um, almost all of our elementary classrooms and you can and bend over and listen to a student read and say tell me what your goal is and um, most of our students are able to tell you that they're working on fluency or they're working on making predictions or they're working on inferencing and um, so this is this is great strides personalized reading instruction in the next slide, you're going to see something that you're familiar with, and we've actually woven our guided reading implementation through this particular um, system for le learning wheel. This is the Hudson School District system for learning, and we're going to show you how that's applied to this system transformation. In the next slide, um, you will see um, something that you're going to hear throughout our presentation, and that, that has to do with these three components that are absolutely necessary in any, um, in any uh, ch effective uh, change implementation. And that is, is that you have to start with high expectations for every learner, um, high expectations for every teacher, high expectations for every principal, high expectations for everyone that supports the system. So along the way, we have high expectations for everyone that's in this system. With, without high support, it's very difficult to have high expectations. And you have been very innovative and generous in your support for pieces like our literacy, um, literacy coaches, for my position. All of that has to do with high support. And you'll hear that woven throughout the system. And then finally, when you have high expectations, high support, you can have high accountability. You will hear us res uh, talk about our results this evening. Um, in all kinds of different ways um, that will show you what our results have been with this system implementation. The next slide again goes back to our wheel and I'm going to focus on the yellow part on the best practices, practices and what guided reading really is. 
Um, on the next slide, we're going to take a look into a first grade classroom at Hudson Prairie, Mrs. Cook's classroom, and I'm going to just talk you through what a guided reading lesson is. Um, this classroom, um, like I said, we're looking at all of those components of gu guided reading like Peg was talking about. As you can see, um, all of the other kids are reading books that they can and want to read at the right level. They have book bins, and you can see that all of the kids that are not part of their guided reading groups are reading books at their just right level. Um, Mrs. Cook is here in a group of um, four students here, and part of guided reading, it's about 15 to 20 minutes depending on the group's needs, and she's starting out with the before reading. She's working with the kids at looking at some of the vocabulary that might be in the text. Um, they might do a picture walk where they're looking and introducing, um, getting some background knowledge um, to what the text would be. So the process is pretty similar. It does change a little bit as you get into upper grades, the complexity of the piece. Um, the kids after the before reading piece, they move on to the during reading, and that is the time after the kids are comfortable with what is the concept, some of the vocabulary. Um, the kids spend time actually reading, and that is where the coaching happens. Kids are reading, everyone's reading at the same time, so it's not like we're waiting for um, the other three kids to be finished reading. They're all reading at the same time, and one at a time, the teacher coaches that student and really looks at what are their personal goals, what are their strengths that they're doing, and what is one thing that they can work on. So they're really getting that personal feedback during the during reading part. And then after reading is where a lot of that comprehension and the retelling takes place as a group. Um, if the teacher would have noticed some difficulties kids were having maybe with accuracy or with understanding of the text, um, that would be the ending part of that group. But you can see that these groups, the kids are really getting a personalized instruction and the teacher is really able to give the students um, feedback on the needs that they have in this group. And we won't watch the whole video, but you can just kind of see what guided reading looks like. And, and as I said, um, you can walk into any classroom and you can see those components of before reading, during reading, and after reading. Um, some of you might wonder, too, um, we said it's a best practice. What does the research really say about guided reading? And this information is from a book um, by John Hattie called Visible Learning, and it really gives statistics on some of the components of guided reading and why they're effective. Um, so. Um, the first thing is, um, as Peg had spoke before, our groups are very fluid. So we're looking at student needs and we're changing those groups based on those students' needs. Um, the small group learning really has a 49% impact on student learning. So just getting kids in that small group setting really has a uh, positive impact. Um, another piece of guided reading is um, the groups are based um, on students' needs. So using that formative assessment, we're using the assessments we're doing to design our instruction, and that has a 90% impact on student achievement, which is huge. And that's what our teachers are doing constantly when they're coaching our students and providing feedback at that time. Also, the teacher clarity um, has a 75% impact, and that is really when the teachers are saying um, what is their focus of their group that day, if it is fluency, if it is looking at retelling the story or whatever that um, um, teaching point might be in that group for the day. Another component um, is having those high expectations that Peg spoke of. We have high expectations for everyone, but having high expectations for students has a 43% impact on student learning. Um, also giving that feedback. That feedback is a huge component of guided reading and that has a 73% impact. And if you think about our adult learning, the feedback that we get, it makes a difference and it truly does for our students as well. And another piece um, of research here, Peg had spoke about the high support. And we have coaching by our literacy coaches that we have in the audience. We have Sue Helmers, our K2 literacy coach, and Vicki Anderson, our um, three through five literacy coach, principals coaching, um, teachers having peer observations. That um, reflection of teaching has an 88% impact on student achievement. And I know um, in some of the classrooms you'll see teachers having flip cameras and they're actually videotaping their own teaching and reflecting with their colleagues um, about what's working, what's not, what we can do better. And that really has an impact. So guided reading really has the research um, base to really make a difference for student achievement. So uh, we'll talk just a little bit now about the support and resources. And again, um, thanks and kudos to our board for, for that support. 
In our next slide, you're going to see, uh, I'll focus most on uh, this particular year, 2009, or excuse me, last year, 2009, 2010, and talk a little bit about some foundational pieces in our system. Uh, what we developed for our, um, for our balanced literacy is we developed what we call tier one guarantees. And what we mean by that is we have guarantees that in every classroom, every student, every day, um, that these, our students are receiving this high quality guaranteed uh, literacy and, and reading and writing curriculum. We also, principals uh, last year began to focus a lot on guided reading within their, um, within their st staff meetings. Coaches observed um, and have observed every single teacher of reading. Um, in our core classrooms and in with their guided reading implementation, just like our students are getting that individual feedback, our coaches then are giving our teachers individual feedback about their teaching in a non-evaluative um, um, supportive coaching role. Also, we have really encouraged um, our teachers to observe one another. We have teachers that have gone all over the district in different grade levels, watching one another teach, um, just, um, just like um, surgeons do after they, they um, have surgeries. They talk about their practice. And it's that same sort of really high quality professional development development and support when you can watch one another um, at what you do. And uh, we also changed the role of our language arts committee. And part of that role is we are cultivating the idea of demonstration classrooms where we are building capacity within our um, each building for those um, literacy facilitators to actually do demonstrations. So for instance, when you have um, a substitute teacher um, because you have um, a, a teacher leave of some kind, the principal can say to that um, new teacher, why don't you go in and watch um, this particular teacher, this literacy leader, this literacy facilitator, um, who can kind of show you what that means to do guided reading or what that means to do a different component. So we're really building capacity within each of our buildings to create their own building literacy leaders. Uh, uh, we also um, obviously offer during our staff development time and training times um, um, additional um, training during the day, um, job embedded training. And finally, our uh, principals focused in their observations last year on actually evaluating teacher practice in the area of, of guided reading. We, um, we phased in guided reading, so it wasn't done all at one time. It was phased in over a course of a couple of years. This year, it is a guarantee. We are in phase three, which, it's, which means that it's measured and monitored and expected. So on to, um, actually, we can scoot to our, our next two slides ahead. Um, monitoring is an extremely important part. When you invest the kind of investment that we've made, we want to make sure that it's happening. And I talked to you a little bit about those tier one guarantees. Um, I talked to you about our phases document and our literacy facilitators who also provide us with feedback um, from the um, teacher practitioner point of view. We also discussed um, how principals were looking in their evaluations. We gave an implementation survey twice last year. We will give that again this year to have um, teachers sort of self-assess where they're at and we look if we're making growth along the continuum. We have lots of feedback loops and you've already heard about our collaborative inquiry for learning during our day six uh, common planning time. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about the um, assessment pieces um, and um, leading into our results. So go ahead, Diane, for the next slide. Um, in December of 2010, we did, um, just this past December, we did a um, district walkthrough. Elementary principals were in every single classroom where, um, for our core classroom teachers, first through fifth grade, to see is guided reading indeed <coughs> happening. And um, we showed 90 point, almost 91% um, almost of our classrooms at that particular point were doing guided reading. We know the, the research says that when you reach a um, implementation rate of 90%, you're really going to transform um, your district. We also had some additional results. Um, last year, um, our, we did an implementation survey and that showed that 91% 
of our teachers felt that they had really increased their confidence in using their assessment data to plan and implement instruction. And um, we also um, have had um, a lot of recognition across the state of Wisconsin. Um, we've had been contacted by at least 10 to 12 districts. This past, I know Mary wrote to you about this, but this past Friday we hosted 27 educators from DeForest. Um, we have spoken at the WASCD um, conference. We're speaking at the school um, board convention. Um, we spoke at the DBI best practices about our system for learning, specifically around guided reading and balanced literacy. When we look at results, um, test scores and student achievement is always something that we um, hold uh, uh, to high regards. We are very proud as a district when we have started to personalize instruction. Um, we started with 81% of our kids reading at grade level in 2008, 2009, and with full implementation we have 86 and we're hoping for that 88% too. So students are really benefiting from personalized instruction and the feedback they're getting with guided reading. Um, the next slide, I have three of my teachers, my elementary literacy facilitators, that are going to speak a little bit about um, what guided reading means to them in their practice. How does it impact them and students? They're going to talk a little bit about the support that they've received from um, the various people, and they're also going to talk about how it's really impacted them as a system. Well, so I feel that I know my students better. Um, I feel that I, I, I can really get into their weaknesses and their strengths. Um, I would agree with that. I definitely know my students better. I, I feel like because I meet with them in a small group, I know everything about them from their reading level to their, their life and things about them that I might not have known before. I think too, that, that personal relationship that you have with them allows you to push them further than you may have been able to before because you know really specifically their strengths, their weaknesses, their interests, and you can guide them and and it allows you to take them further than you would have been able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fun then, you can make those connections with those kids and it, it just kind of helps build a bigger bond and they, they can connect to more of the things that we are reading about when you can bring it on a personalized level with them. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can definitely tell where they start to break down in the reading process and, and I can definitely tell, I like to put their aha moments, it's like, Especially in kindergarten, I can see it's like they look at me like, oh, I just read that. You know, it's just, I just love the connection, like you said, the connection that I'm making. But I also feel it makes me more confident in parent-teacher conferences, that I'm more confident with um, reporting to the parents about their strengths and their weaknesses, where we need to work on, look at the successes. That's helped me quite a bit, too. And they're excited to come. Um, when I always tell my kids after I meet with them the next time, Okay, I'm going to see you on Thursday, and we'll get together and talk about. And and I do that on purpose because they're so excited. They come to me on Thursday and say, "It's my day with you today." So they do look forward to it. It helps guide my instruction too. I can tell, like just today when I was doing the DRA, I can tell. Okay, I need to work on their rereading strategies or getting your mouth ready. So I'm taking notes, and and I can tell this is where I need to go now. Yeah, the support. Um, we have received has been phenomenal between the, the collaborative time with our teams um, now that the schedule has been changed, the on the planning time, uh, the day six collaboration, and the opportunity to have the literacy coaches, um, I think has been a, a wonderful opportunity for us to really focus our instruction. Um, we now, with the, the shift in literacy, have shifted how we teach and how <clears throat> we do business, but with that shift, then it's required us to change our practice. And the uh, professional development has really helped us to grow to better meet, meet the needs of our students. It's been a, a very nice variety and a diversity of the type of support that, that we've received. Um, Sue and Vicki. Sue and Vicki. have our literacy coaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I use Sue in a couple different ways. I'll have her come and and model something that I'm not quite sure of, and so to see it in actual practice, yes. and then we get together and talk about it right there when it's fresh in your mind, and I just feel that that really improves um, my teaching. And I think our needs as teachers are very diverse, and so you know that, that one-size-fits-all staff development is helpful to begin, 
But now as we're learning and growing and developing, having that individualized opportunity for staff development with our literacy coaches has really changed, I think, our practice and, and made us better teachers. I've really enjoyed being able to, and you know, with principals giving us the flexibility and covering for us, being able to go and observe my other peers. Like I've been able to go to a couple different buildings to observe other kindergarten teachers doing the guided reading, and it helps to reaffirm for me, it's like, oh, okay, I am doing that. So, and I just found that so helpful able to observe my other peers. The other thing we've, we've given ourselves the opportunity to do is work with our team and use our colleagues, even just within our own team now that we have that common planning time, to talk about our practice and, and what's going well and what's not going well and what's working for you and how you're making that work and can I do that too and, and that collaborative um, time to process our instruction. Our conversations have gotten deeper. Yes, definitely. definitely. Yeah. When, you know, that's that's another plus side to it. I feel like now, when there's professional things that I want to talk about, we're all on board on the same thing. Um, you know, we've watched some videos together, we've shared some books together, and you know, it just it makes us all better teachers. The other thing is that I know um, their students too, okay. yeah. and so when we yeah. we come together, we kind of get all of our brains together and just say. You know, I think this might work. Why don't you try this? So we have more than one person trying mm -hmm. an idea. I, I feel that the, the implementa implementation of, of guided reading, um, having the consistency across the district has really helped, not just uh, with my team, but with the kindergarten teachers across the district. We have, like, we can have the same conversations, deeper conversations, and, and the sharing of ideas has been huge for us, and I think it makes us stronger as a team across the district. Absolutely, and I think our strength has grown dramatically as our individual teams within our buildings as well. Not only in using each other as resources to help us grow, but helping each other, knowing all of the kids, and, and everybody owns all of the kids. It's not your student, it's our student, and we're all problem solving through to support that child, which I think is a shift. And we have common goals. I mean, we definitely have a common focus and a common goal now that we're all working towards, and it's all for one main thing. And I think that, I mean, before it always was, but I think it's so much more we have the common language, and um, we're all on the same page, I guess. Mm -hmm. The conversations have definitely switched to the student successes, student support, and instructional ideas. Like, I, I know that we're always popping into each other's classrooms saying, well, how did you do this? Or we informally meet out in the pod, and we don't mean to, and we're just sitting and talking, it's like, well, you know, Having this lesson, how did you do this? Well, I do it this way. I mean, I've learned to have some kids go underneath the table during guided reading while you're listening to just one person. I thought, I never would have thought of that. And the kids loved it. So, so thank you to our elves. Um, Chloe Bryan is a second grade elf um, from Hudson Prairie. Sue Jensen is a kindergarten elf from Hudson Prairie. And Amanda McCarthy is our intermediate or our fifth grade elf from Hudson Prairie. And I think their words really speak um, to what guided reading has done to the profession and what the impact is on our students. And, and I think the system piece, again, comes through in their words. So I, I thank them for sharing their um, perspectives as well. And as Peg spoke to in the beginning, um, really to make this happen, we do need high expectations for everyone, high expectations for teachers, students, principals, everyone in the district. And we do provide the high support. The teachers really spoke to the support of literacy coaches, principals, um, their colleagues. And I think that those high expectations can really happen. And we have seen that with our data, with the high, high support, and then also the high accountability that we do um, have at this district. And then now we're available to take any questions. Are there questions? Dan. Thank you for the report. Very good. Um, here's my question. Um, we just saw the enrollment projections. Um, <clears throat> I have a daughter in fifth grade. It's already in a classroom that's approaching 30 kids. Now, one of the slides talks about you know, small group learning, small group learning has a 49% impact on student learning. Is this making some assumptions on sizes of classrooms? Plus, as we start seeing this enrollment grow, you know, are, are those concerns for you folks or are you? 
Well, I think certainly the class size guidelines help us to make sure that we're seeing kids more often. We believe in this philosophy and practice. What would happen if class sizes grew? We would probably have more groups of three to five in a classroom, so of course the teacher wouldn't be able to give that personalized instruction as often. So I think there would be a, a negative impact. So I do believe that the small class sizes really help us to personalize, know our students, and see them on a regular basis um, and provide that feedback. So there is a direct correlation to okay. that. Thank you. Yes, um, what is the size, he said it's approaching 30, so what is the size that you're talking about as being a small? Um, we have 18 to 23 in the primary grades and 23 to 27 in the intermediate grades, and that's currently where our class size guidelines are, and that is um, at, a good, at a good size to give that personalized feedback. There are some schools that have, might be close to the, you know, the high end, and some that might be towards that low end. Okay. Um, the other question is, you said that we were at 91% uses the classroom. What about the other 9%? I have to tell you, that was the same question that was asked at our staff meeting when we did some reflections. Um, one of the things, because you know our teachers want to be 100% and, and they want to have a redo is what some of the teachers actually had said in my building. Um, but really what we were looking at is we're just looking at during the month of December, there were some classrooms that were doing some of their assessments, the um, Bontis and Pinella assessments, which is very a valid practice that they can be doing at that time to gain student um, um, some knowledge of their students and where they're at. So sometimes they were doing um, some of those pieces. Sometimes it just happened when we principals walked in, you know, if their schedule changed a little bit, if they had, you know, a, a guest or something like that happening. But it just, we just went in during that reader's workshop. So we really feel that the 90%, it probably is higher. It just happened to be when all of us went into their classrooms. Oh, so the actual, what was going on that <laughs> week in your evaluation? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Other questions, Mark? Uh, no, just just a comment, uh, Madam President. Thanks. I was trying to. I can't move my computer back slides <laughs> fast enough. But uh, a couple of things. First of all, just a great report. Um, particularly enjoyed hearing directly from their teachers up on the screen. That that's that's wonderful. I can really feel their enthusiasm. Um, and and additionally, I want to say and again, I can't find the slide. I think we have uh, we did a five percent increase in students at, at reading level in a single year. I think that's just that's just Terrific. I mean, now we're at, I think it was 86%, am I correct? Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, I know, you know, going forward, the increments will probably be smaller because once you start getting to, you know, full capacity, and, and so, you know, I, I understand that. But I think just even that single little snapshot there is just demonstrating phenomenal work. So, uh, congratulations. Keep up the good and work. And th the beauty of that, too, is it, it really builds the efficacy of the teachers when they can see that the results of their work. Um, and the students, um, that students are growing and um, that, that really builds a sense of pride among our teachers as well about now they have proof that you know, students sure. are growing and learning. Absolutely. It, it just one thought just flashed in my mind. A couple of other board members mentioned about the groups now. Again, once again, is, is sort of the uh, four to five students per reading group, is that sort of the, the ideal numbers that were kind of what we're shooting for? Yes, about four to five. Four and five. Um, when they're in an intervention, sometimes um, if, if they're receiving a reading intervention, um, which is a little bit different from guided reading. So if guided reading is not, if they're not successful during guided reading, they may be, they may receive an intervention, a reading intervention, um, either from the classroom teacher or the reading specialist. The, the um, size might be individual sure. or up to three to four students. Sure. You know, and that's something I'm, I'm really enthused about, too. I mean, when you can, you can do, give that individualized instruction, you know, have, you know, having that common goal, but realizing that everybody won't, won't get there at the same pace and needs some additional support, um, and you know, making sure every student can reach their potential. And I, and I realize that there, there's going to be cases when it's going to have to be one-on-one, -on -one and, and I hope we can right. continue to have the resources to provide that where it's needed. The other feedback that we've received from parents, which has been extremely positive, is that when we have students that are already reading significantly above grade level, these students are still challenged. So we have challenge at every single level. This is just um, not for students on grade level or students below grade level, but all students are challenged. All students are reading and engaged and thinking deeply in books that um, are, are where they're at. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, I just would, uh, Mark's question about size of, or maybe it was Dan's question about size of classroom. Um, you know, our classrooms, although we say they're small, they're really not when we look at our class size guidelines. And if we would look at the research on class sizes, they would be much smaller. Uh, we are building the system around the guidelines that we have to support uh, reading and um, very positive results. And I want to just uh, compliment the work of our administrative leaders um, at the principal level, at the district level, and certainly our teacher leaders who are uh, supporting this work and helping us make uh, good decisions to promote student learning and to make every child a successful reader um, and each, each teacher in the classroom. Um, but with that said, we we're talking about elementary numbers. And we've heard from middle school sixth grade teachers that our students are coming in and reading at a higher level and also that they love to read. Now when I think about the numbers that we just saw at the middle school, we have a problem. We have a problem we are talking about in a, few, uh, a few minutes ago about space for learning. And so we are out of space at the middle school. Classes will begin to even be larger than they are right now. And that is going to have an impact and a negative impact over time. And, and something that um, certainly is, is a big concern for us as we think about these students and their future and investing in that future. Thanks, Mary. Um, last under, oh, I'm sorry, next under the reports section is um, a study of district property on Highway UU as a school site. And Tim, I think you're going to yes. get us into that conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Mark uh, Bolke to come up. Mark is from Hoffman LLC, and Mark is a uh, land planner with Hoffman. He's worked with uh, many school districts across the state of Wisconsin, and uh, uh, Mark worked uh, very, very involved here with uh, Rivercrest and the planning that went on for Rivercrest and uh, taking from, from annexation all the way through the, to the end product that you see uh, today. Uh, we asked Mark to look at County Trunk Highway UU. We have approximately 110 acres uh, on UU uh, between Crosby Road and uh, I believe it was Country View. And uh, so Mark took a look at that property and he has prepared a uh, preliminary site evaluation. And I'm going to have Mark uh, go through his report with you. Mark? Okay. Is this on? I guess it, it is. is. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, first of all, two things. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's nice to be back. Uh, it's been a, been a little while. Uh, and secondly, I'm a little bit under the weather, so if there's any coughing or sniffling, I apologize. Um, the, the report I put together, I hope you all had a chance to review it. I'm not going to sit and read it to you. Uh, so I'm just going to go through some of the highlights of how I, how I or we as, at Hoffman evaluate sites. Um, and I guess to take a step back to introduce myself, Tim introduced me, but my background is purely in site evaluation, site design, and site approvals for projects for Hoffman, and I've been doing this about 30 years, and I have a degree in landscape architecture from uh, Madison. Um, I was asked to look at the UU site, and uh, I'll be honest with you, my first reaction was it's a, it's a, very, uh, it's, it's a very rough site. It has a lot of topography to it. That was my, my first impression. And this study is basically to look at it relative to a potential secondary school on the site. So I'll preface by saying that it's important to know that that's what was being looked at here uh, for this particular study. The site is about 110 acres, and it's two parcels that you currently own. Uh, and the, there's uh, Crosby uh, Road, or Drive, I, I forget what, it's, what the exact word is, but uh, is on the east, and County Trunk UU is on the north side of the property. It's basically surrounded by uh, existing residential large lot development. 
and then across Crosby to the east is, uh, I believe, your, some athletic fields, uh, soccer fields. Uh, as a base for the evaluation, uh, I, I listed everything, all the information that I gathered. And this, again, this, this study is based on existing information. Uh, there was not a lot of new gen generation of information. So we wanted to evaluate the site based on, on the existing information. And uh, so that in included mainly uh, website research from the county website, talking to the city, talking to a local uh, engineering firm, um, and uh, input from, uh, from the school district as to the potential uh, development that could occur here. Uh, the evaluation criteria, and these can vary a little bit, but for a, a large secondary school uh, and looking at the site that we're, we are, I felt these were the most important criteria to look at, and these are always important for any site evaluation. But really with, with large schools, the, the main thing is usable area. And uh, I've worked with a lot of school districts that have large parcels of land like this and uh, recommendations from different publications may recommend 40, 50, 60, 80 acres for, for large secondary schools. But you really need to look at the usable area. I've evaluated a lot of properties that had a lot of acreage, but uh, you have really got to evaluate the usable acreage. So that's really the most important uh, feature. And, and I think you'll see in the report is is really uh, talked about quite a bit extensively. Uh, so we looked at, at that, at access. Uh, again, this, these types of schools need really good access for parents, visitors, students, staff. Uh, so that's, that's pretty critical. Uh, and, and it's different for an elementary school. I mean, there's a big difference between a small elementary school and a, and a large secondary school. And especially if you get into a high school level, obviously you've got student drivers, so access is, is uh, and availability of access is, is even more important. Uh, utility service, uh, we looked at. Uh, site development costs, we looked at. Um, and then some of the other criteria, and I didn't focus a lot on those other criteria because I, I focused on the top uh, five here, or four, I should say, uh, criteria. So. I'm not going to get into a lot more on those. I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly go through my analysis of the site. And uh, based on the criteria, the usable land area and the site capacity uh, is, is very limited. And I put exhibits in the report that, that would uh, identify those areas that, that really make it difficult for development. The, the county website is very good. Uh, it has some very good information. I included a, a exhibit in here that highlights the uh, steep slopes on the site. And that's one of the first things we look at is the, the amount of elevation change on the site and the slopes on the site. Uh, large secondary schools obviously have, you typically have large buildings, large parking lots, and athletic fields. Those don't, th there's kind of a disconnect between steep slopes and a lot of elevation change and those, those types of uses. So. That's, that was the, the, one of the main things uh, on this site is there's, you've got about 110 acres, and the publication I've referenced in, the, in here recommends typically for high school like that, you'd want 60 to 70 usable acres. And this site may be close to that and, have, and offer that amount of acreage, but the other thing we need to look at here is how how disjointed those parcels are, how isolated some of them are, and how the, the slopes um, really disconnect those, those pieces. And, and Exhibit E you've got up on the board there now uh, really highlights that. If you look at the white areas, those I would consider more usable. The areas in the darker brown color are the, the very steep slopes. And those are pretty much reflected on the, on the county website uh, diagram this in the report also. And I highlighted some examples and on the diagram I highlighted some some uh, spot elevations on site just to just to, sh to show you how pronounced those elevation changes are. 
And the most pronounced one is in the southeast corner of the site, right above what you see as an out parcel there. There's a, a lightly shaded area, and that area is, there's five to six acres there of usable land, but it's 70, it's, it's 50 to 80 feet above the land below it. So there's a tremendously steep slope there. So, you know, as part of a development for, the, for a secondary school, it, it's just, it, it's not feasible to use that piece of property because it's gonna have that 50 or 60, 70 feet. And then the area, the, the county also has, um, in their ordinances, has some restrictions on what you can develop. The, it, in the county ordinance, it actually says that in anything above 25% slope, you cannot develop. Um, so, and there are slopes in these areas that are uh, above 25%. So those areas would be very difficult to develop, uh, not only physically, but also from an, from an approval standpoint, it may be very difficult to do anything to disturb those, those slopes. And it certainly isn't good environmental practice to, to do that anyway. So um, in simple terms, the usable area is, is questionable, but it's very, very limiting because of the separation uh, of, of the areas on site. There's also a drainage ravine that runs through, kind of through the middle of the western part of the site. Uh, and, and that's a natural drainage ravine that isolates that parcel up to the west, to the north and west, that lightly shaded parcel. Uh, that, again, is a, is a natural barrier that it, it, it doesn't s seem to make sense to completely disturb a natural drainage uh, basin. Uh, and in this case, again, it isolates that piece from the other property. And some of this you'll see, uh, you can see in some of the concepts, I'll call them, for the site capacity study that were in the, in the two final exhibits in the report. You'll see how, how that, those, uh, putting those big development pieces on this property I is difficult at best. Uh, the other thing in, that I, I referenced on page three under the usable land area and site capacity is the the other thing that would occur here, I if developed, would be there would be extreme additional cost involved in developing this parcel for, again, for this type of use. Because of the large, uh, athletic fields are large flat areas. Uh, a, a, a large secondary school building is easily and, and best developed on a, on a flatter site as is the parking. So basically you'd have to create these plateaus on this site and to do that uh, we looked at the site and uh, I worked with uh, Stevens Engineering and, and we looked at just some, some rough ideas on how you could possibly grade out some of these areas to make them work and uh, I referenced a, a cost in here and, and we felt pretty comfortable that it, there could be as much as a million dollars of additional cost for this type of development on this site, and that's additional, that's not complete, that's above and beyond what you'd, you'd see at a, a, a typical flat, flatter site uh, that didn't have these isolated areas, steep slopes, ravines, and, and there's also some site clearing costs that would be added because of the trees on site. Um, so you're starting to see that the cost uh, it would be a, a major issue also. The second criteria is access. Uh, UU is a two-lane road right now. Typically, uh, a lot of the high schools we worked on, we work on, uh, would best fit high school, secondary school, especially a high school would want to be on a on a major street. This is a major street, but it's two lanes, and it's two lanes both directions for quite a distance. Uh, so I'd anticipate if it were developed as any type of secondary school, you'd certainly need road improvements on UU because it's, it's really the main street to get here. Uh, it, there's other streets. Crosby is on the east side. Uh, certainly could provide a secondary or possibly a primary access, but it's a, it's a residential street, uh, especially as it goes south. 
uh, off of UU, it, it turns into a very winding <laughs> residential street, so you wouldn't really want to bring traffic to this site from the south on Crosby. There's a, there's a street on the west side, Forest Drive, that butts into the property line, but again, it's, it's, it's a residential street in a large lot, residential subdivision, not the kind of street you're going to want to bring uh, main traffic in. So it, basically, I focused on UU, and I think to develop this site, I think there certainly would be, I mean, look at what we, what we had to do here at, at Rivercrest. I mean, there were substantial costs to improve uh, the road out here, and I think you could anticipate that and possibly more here uh, if, you, if you developed as a secondary school in a much larger school than, than is the case here. So I, I think that's, it's pretty obvious that the, the roads uh, are an issue also here. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in the days, I can remember the days when cities and counties would um, participate in those costs, if not just improve the roads, but that doesn't happen anymore. It, it doesn't matter what kind of uh, development it is, even if it's a public school, Typically, you are considered a developer, and all the costs are yours. So, uh, I I can almost guarantee you that all the costs for those improvements would be part of the part of any school project on this site. Uh, the next criteria was utility service. Uh, here, there's some some challenges. Also, this is not in the city. It is about uh, a half mile from the nearest more than a half mile from the nearest public utility service. So there's, there's really two options to look at. One is on-site utilities, or the other is, is public utilities. So we've evaluated both, and there was a report done, and I've referenced it in here. And I'm not going to get into all that, but I, could, I, I can reference if there's any questions on that. I can try to answer them. But I reviewed it, and basically what I gleaned from it is either opportunity or either option for utility service to this site is challenging and costly. Uh, the public utility option, and I'm talking mainly about uh, water and sanitary sewer service, um, you, you would have to extend the service over a quor uh, over half mile. It's near Carmichael and UU or, uh, right now. So it would have to be extended uh, over half mile and typically the city's policy is they don't extend utilities to parcels outside the city. Uh, so there's kind of a conflict there, and there is no city property around this property, so it's not contiguous uh, to, the, to the city. So um, there are extreme options such as annexing down roadways that I've seen done occasionally. It's not something that most cities would like to do, especially the times I've seen that done, it's usually for a large tax generator, uh, industrial, commercial, where there's a real incentive for the city to, to do that. Here, again, you're considered, uh, you know, you're, gonna, you're not generating a lot of uh, tax revenue for the city, so there's really not a, a lot of incentive for them to do that. And uh, one thing I referenced in here also is there's some extreme cost to, to extend those from the city. There's the annexation issue. And then also um, there's, there's a certain capacity that the city has, for instance, in the sewer plant for the city. And it's my understanding that they, the plant right now with, with the additional development that could occur in the city is, would be at capacity. So there could be some absolute unknown costs that, uh, that we really can't anticipate. And those could be costs uh, such as we want to upgrade our entire system because you want to come on, online and you're going to generate a lot of uh, sewage. So there may be costs that the city would ask you to bear in that regard also. So uh, there are things in here that we, and I, I mentioned in here several times, it's really hard to quantify some of these things. So we, we tried to quantify the things we, we could with, with some basic engineering and the report that, the other report that was done. 
uh, the other option for utility service would be on-site facilities, and those, according to the report that were done, was done, uh, again would be ex extremely costly, and, then they, and, and I'm talking about millions. Uh, and I put there, there are some numbers in here: 1.2 to 2.5 million for sanitary sewer on-site treatment plant, um, 210 to 335 thousand dollars for an on-site well. So you're, you're, you're talking up into the millions uh, to do that. And with an on-site system, in the, in the report that was done, it's also identified that it would be diff very difficult to locate those things on-site because there's distance requirements for things like wastewater treatment. They, can ha they have to be certain distances from existing homes. And so it would, it would narrow down the area that you could put that on-site and it happens that it narrows it down to some of the area that kind of right in the middle of the site, which is better suited, is some of the few areas that are good for large development areas, it would, it would end up in the middle of that. So it would, it would rest, again, be one more component that probably wouldn't fit well on the site. Um, and uh, the report actually said it just flat out does not, it's not a, not very feasible on this site to do on-site solutions. Uh, the site, uh, the, the last criteria, site development cost, it really is, I, I mentioned everything that I wanted to say about that, uh, but I think the main thing to, to take from the site development cost section here is that if, if there were an option that you could put, bring the public utilities to this site, get the property annexed, that I would estimate two to three million dollars of costs above and beyond what I would call a, a, a development ready site. For instance, a, a greenfield site that didn't have this kind of topography that was relatively flat uh, on, a, on a major road that, that maybe had capacity for, for the traffic. Uh, and just didn't have these, uh, this isolation on site and uh, especially didn't have the utility issues, had utility access available. So that was the public's uh, utility option. And the on-site option, on-site utility option, we estimated a, a, a range of two and a half to $3.9 million of cost, again, above and beyond a similar site that didn't have the challenges that this site has. Um, in the report, under other criteria, I touched on again the site approvals. Again, to get the public utilities, you would need annexation. Even if you didn't, if you go to the on-site uh, utility option, you would still need, uh, it's, the property would still need uh, some sort of rezoning site plan approval, those are pretty typical. Even if it stay, remained in the county, it would still uh, still need those approvals from the county and the town. Uh, the surrounding land use is, other than UU to the north, is, is uh, all large lot residential. Probably better suited for a, a smaller, if this were developed as a school site, probably as a, a smaller school that you see uh, typically a, Elementary schools are better suited for residential areas. High schools, you'll see a lot of times newer high schools are in transition areas, in higher density, higher developed areas than, than uh, residential. Uh, the, the other utility needs, again, we didn't look at that uh, in any detail here, but there would be, it would be part of that next step if you were to move forward with any kind of development of the site, we'd wanna look at the things like electric, gas, phone, fiber optic, uh, things like that, and see what, what cost would be associated with, with those. Uh, the, the next section on page six, I, I, I basically <coughs> like to just put something in here about positive and negative attributes that just summarizes that. So again, I'm not gonna go through the site negatives that are listed there because I've basically touched on all of those. Um, as far as the positive, positives, I, I was able to generate three. Um, one is you already own it, so that's a good thing. Uh, it's an attractive site. 
with trees and hills and, and things like that. Uh, I guess that's a positive. For it, it, it would be if, if maybe the land were a little bit different, I think, and had more potential in a larger usable area. And then the adjacent, it's adjacent to some sports fields, which is always nice. Uh, schools, uh, it's always nice when you're adjacent to existing athletic facilities. So I, I saw that as a positive. Um, uh, and again, in the, the conclusion section, um, I think there was one thing in here. I, I, again, it's pretty redundant. It's going through the same thing, but there's some things that I didn't really touch on yet, and that's design flexibility. If you would develop this as a large secondary school, I think you'd be very, very limited in where the building could go, how the building would be designed. It would probably make sense to have it multi-story, but I think you'd be given that as a condition without really evaluating whether it's a, a good, good thing for a, for a new school. Um, so there's things like that, and then future expansion along with that would be, could be very difficult and challenging to, to know how to expand when you're dealing with this kind of topography. Uh, so that, I, think, I think that's important. Uh, and basically, I will read one sentence. Um, it's, it says, it is our opinion, it's my opinion, uh, that this site is a very poor site for development of a large secondary school. I think that's, that's uh, my simplest conclusion that I can come up with based on everything that you read in here. Again, if it were evaluated for something else, the criteria and conclusions could definitely be different. But for what, what we were asked to look at, uh, I think that's, I feel pretty strongly about that conclusion. At the end, I did list some additional investigation that could be done. Uh, the reason a lot of these things weren't done is because we want to do, we typically do a preliminary investigation or evaluation before you start spending a lot of money. The things that I listed here uh, on, at the end of the report all start to cost money. So I think maybe, you know, you, have to, you can look at whether it's, it makes sense to go, to spend more dollars to move forward with an evaluation or if there's other things that you may want to evaluate for this as, as far as the use of this site. So, uh, and then uh, at the end in the appendix, I just are all the exhibits and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions on any of those or anything else in the report. Mark, would you go through the layouts and oh, yeah. um, how it fits on the yep. site? Because I think that yep. that's an You're important, you about referred to it, yes. Exhibit F and G. Yeah, and these, um, I, I'm, real, I, I'm always hesitant to do these, especially on challenging sites, because when you look at Exhibit F and Exhibit G, they look like design solutions. And we don't have nearly enough information from you or from the, the typical uh, sources that we would get information from to do a design for this site. So. I want to preface it by saying these are, because I don't want people to say, well, why did you put a baseball field there, and why did you put a, a softball field here, or the, the, the best thing I can say is that the, the layouts are, are capacity, I, I use the term capacity study, it's to understand how these large elements fit, could fit on the site, and just to give you some perspective on what a baseball field, what a softball field, what a track and football field, and what a building area would look like relative to the size of the site. The, the one thing we did do in both of these exhibits is we did try to put the elements in the areas that they probably made most sense from a topographic standpoint. So, uh, you, and we can draw some, several conclusions from doing that. Uh, one is on Exhibit F, we showed a building and parking zone, which would be, in this case, I estimated that at, a, at plus or minus 20 acres, because I, for a secondary school 
the size we're talking about, um, th that's what you would need. Um, based on the on projects I've worked on, we the, the zones for the parking and building for that size of development are typically 20, 20 plus acres. So I showed an area about that size just to give you some idea how much area that would take up in and of itself. I didn't show a building um, a, a building box or a parking lot or anything like that. I just think it's too premature to do that. But basically, the probably the best large area that is nicely shaped is on, on Crosby, and that's the, the 20 some acres. And so in this in exhibit F, it, would lo it was logical to show that building and parking zone there. And then scatter the other major elements on the site in areas that aren't in the steep slopes or in the drainage ravine. Uh, but I will tell you, even those green forms on there that say baseball, softball, track football, practice field, even those areas where they're shown would take extensive grading even to put them where I showed them on here, even in the areas that we consider more development friendly on the site. For instance, uh, I think where I showed that box for a track and football field area, there's actually about, I think, 20, 20 <coughs> some feet of fall within that, just in that green box. So it's, that's why when I told you before about development costs, that it could be up to a million dollars to try to make this site fit this type of use. That, those are the kind of things we're talking about. There's extensive, uh, there'd be really extensive grading and earth moving to, to make those, those big flat elements fit on the site. So in exhibit F, we looked at what I would consider the, the most logical building and parking zone on Crosby and then exhibit G, we just wanted to look at what if, what if it weren't on on the Crosby uh, fronting property, where could you put it? Well, again, I took about a 20, a little over 20 acre area and just put it kind of in the middle of the site in, in some of the usable area. Unfortunately, it, 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 there is underneath that box, there is a, a steep slope area if you go back to the other exhibits. So I basically assumed we could work with that slope, although it would be very, very, very difficult to do. The nice thing about this layout, if, it, if you actually laid it out this way, is the school and, and the, the building and the parking is more centrally located on the site. On the first one, on exhibit F, the distance, and I referenced it in the report, from the school and building zone <coughs> to the farthest field is about a half, is over half a mile. So it shows you how, I use the word disjointed and distant things could be on the property uh, typically, you'd like to develop the building and parking more central to the site. So that's why we looked at Exhibit G, is, is to look at an alternative. So the good thing about Exhibit G is it, it shows the building and, and parking zone more centrally located. The bad thing is it's it, on, on that building and parking zone, there's probably 30 or 40, 50 feet of fall from one side to the other. Again, you, you're dealing with really extreme conditions. So. Uh, that was really the reason we wanted to, to look at that, the capacity looking at the building and, and parking zone there. And that was really the only, the only difference. And we moved some of the, the major field components up onto the Crosby uh, frontage where they would, would uh, fit a little bit better in this, uh, in this concept. Uh, did, did I explain it well enough? Thank you for asking that. I <laughs> wanted to. Are there questions for Mark while we have him? Dan. Thanks, Mark, for that. A um, couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, would it be safe to say if we were looking for a site to include all the football and all these practice fields, that we would almost need, um, you know, the extent of this land, hundred upwards of a hundred acres? So when, so when you're saying 68, 60 to acre, eight, 60 to 70 acres site for 2,000 student enrollment, you're really not taking into account the, all the practice football fields. Yeah, that includes that. Oh, it does? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've worked, on all the high schools I've worked on over the years, uh, I can think of one that we had about 150 acres 
but it was a parcel um, less challenging than this, but it, it did have, uh, it, was, it was very similar to this site, only it had a really nice, about 50 or 60 acre part of it that was nice and flat and all contiguous, and then the rest of it was, was more like the, the western part of this site. Uh, the 60, 60 to 70, um, I'll give you an example, the high school that's closest to my home uh, is, a, is a 2,000 student high school. So it's, it's being a high school that obviously has some additional maybe athletic fields and more parking than a, than a middle school would have. But uh, it is on uh, 60 acres and it's packed in and it has exactly the elements that you see on the on the capacity analysis in uh, on exhibit F and G, but it's it's extreme. I mean, it's a perfect square that was er and every piece of it was developable. It was mm -hmm. and it was it probably had uh, the challenge with that site was it was too flat. <coughs> it was hard to get it to drain. We actually had to raise some of the site up to get it to drain. But um, so that 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 was a very good example because it's about as efficient as you can get, and it's on 60 acres of a perfect square flat piece of property. And here there is probably 60 acres of usable land uh, but again it's so disjointed and isolate there's pieces that are isolated and even the areas I mentioned even the areas that I did put down as usable are still um, not uh, relatively flat there there's a lot still a lot of grade change within those areas. Sure. The, um, that lot closest to Crosby Drive um, with, I think it's Exhibit F, um, is that a relatively, I guess I haven't been out there for a while, is that a relatively flat or um, are you suggesting that? Yeah, the, I think that, of, that of the, in of and the of two it. drawings, <laughs> would you say for a buildable site, the, using that that original 22 acre um, yep. would probably. Yeah, that, that site, uh, again, it, it, has, it has plenty of grade to drain. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see the elevations I highlighted on there go from 916 to elevation of 910, and then there's, on the north side, it, drop, it dips down to 885. So there is, even on that, that area, there's a grade change of 30 feet. So again, it's, it's usable. I think it would be a nice site for a smaller mm -hmm. development uh, in, or a smaller elementary school or el an elementary school type development. But again, if, unless you um, are willing to compromise your site pro your, your program mm -hmm. and say, we could put a high school in the parking on there, but then your fields wouldn't fit very well and they'd be extremely expensive to build. Uh, and I've worked with schools that have, have located on uh, high schools and middle schools on, on some sites that are a little bit smaller, but uh, they, there's a compromise there. Mm -hmm. They usually say, well, we're gonna keep our old football field and we're, gonna, we're not gonna be able to do this on site, or we're not gonna be able to do that. And uh, most of the districts that we've worked with that are doing a brand new school that is a 30, 40, 50 year solution don't want to start out in a box where they're, they're trapped and already know they don't have enough land for mm -hmm. present or future. Um, question regarding with this school, as you know, um, we have the utilities, but also with this school we have a very unique, um, when I say wastewater, um, you know, the waterless systems mm -hmm. in the bathrooms. D does that ease some of the pressure it, as it, it relates to some of these sites that are off the yep. public systems? Yeah, it, it would ease some of the pressure, but it would not, um, I think in the report that, that you had done, the engineering report on, on the utilities, the, they still, there's still certain formulas you have to use for a certain size building. Mm -hmm. And they, those formulas tell, are gonna say that it's gonna generate this much sewage. Sure. And in the report, they, they mentioned that there, it, 
you couldn't use a conventional septic type system uh, because of those formulas that the state and the county would use uh, for for development uh, of a large secondary school. So, in reality, yes, it would generate. If you could do things like that, and this school has proven it, you can you can reduce what actually comes out of the school. I don't know that it would change what you had to do uh, by code on the site, but uh, in reality, yeah, I think you'd be able to reduce it. Okay, thank you. Madam President, well, thank you for the report. Um, it, for me, at least, it was disappointing information to hear, particularly when we have a secondary space solution that we need to solve, and clearly the site isn't going to work. Um, it doesn't change the fact that we're still challenged to solve that problem. I just wanted to ask, I know the scope of your work was to look at it for a secondary space solution, but would you still um, feel comfortable with the costs that you came up with if it was looked at for an elementary site in the future, or? Things would change. The, co the costs in here would, would be different. Because it, it, the school, uh, I assume you're not going to do an elementary school with 2,000 students. Exactly. So exactly. The, the, the numbers would change. Uh, the, the solutions would change. Uh, elementary schools typically the ones that we've worked on and the, some of the uh, publications that recommend sizes for school sites, a lot of times an elementary school is recommended 10 to 20 acres of usable land for an elementary school okay. is, is adequate. I'll, I'll reference Rivercrest. Rivercrest is about 40 acres, I believe. This it was 38, 39 acres here. So this is a, this is a very large uh, elementary school site and there was, a, we, did, we did a really, uh, the stormwater basins were expanded to do a, a really good solution. So to take advantage of that extra acreage you had, they, there were some limitations with some slopes and woods uh, along Cooley. So this site, uh, I, I think the usable area that we have on this site is probably in that 20 to 25 acre range to give you some idea. And this is a, I would consider a large, medium to large elementary school. Madam President, I just want to uh, clarify, you know, uh, Mark's been talking about this report and what we asked Kaufman to do was focus on the largest option uh, solution that we would look at. And I want to be really clear that there is no um, determination at this point about what the solution is for our um, overcrowding problem. We just felt that if we looked at a large school on the property that we had, then if that fit, we knew anything else um, that was smaller would also fit. And uh, we need to do a little more research if we were looking at smaller um, schools as an elementary school on the site, on a portion of the site, mm -hmm. um, to look at that. But again, I want to be really clear: there is uh, significant work that we need to do with our community and the board about various options um, that would solve the problem both at the high school and the middle school. And so the focus of this report was just on a large school that um, we could consider as one of the options, but not the option that's still to be determined. Madam President, thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, first, first, excuse me, real quick question. Tell me about this out parcel right smack in the middle of this thing. Uh, my big recollection is that the original owner wanted to retain that spot or something. Is I, that I, I don't know. Tim, did you ever find anything else out about that yeah. property? Yeah, that, that was uh, in, an agree in the purchase agreement that the uh, seller did retain that portion of the property. Okay, and, and, and still does, Tim, right? Still does, yeah. So we have this, this, <laughs> this island in the middle of our school property. That, okay. Right. Um, I guess just on its face, I don't care for that. Uh, Mark, just I want to walk me through a worst case scenario here. There, you know, reading your report, I'd agree with Lynn. It was, it was certainly was very troubling. There's it just one hurdle after another. Um, you know, I think in the context of the time, anticipating probably future development, a lot of these things, you know, maybe ha wouldn't have occurred. You know, annexation, road improvements, et cetera. But you know, the hindsight is 2020. Here we are now, obviously, with a, with a, a need that's coming up, and, and this is a site we have. But Probably one of my biggest concerns was, was the utilities. 
-hmm. So, and, and again, I, I like to play the worst case scenario things. Now, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we're, there's no contiguous property. Annexation, I think, would be almost impossible. I don't have to tell anybody in this room how much of a battle it was to annex this property. And that we're right outside the city. So that would seem to be a, a, a tremendous challenge. In addition, you referenced the capacity of uh, Hudson's sewage um, plant. Right. And so even, even if, even if there, there's a real, is there, is there actually a real scenario that the, the city couldn't hook us up without a tremendous infrastructure uh, um, investment? Is that right? Um, I can't speak for the city, but yeah. Based on what we went through, and I went through that process here with with you, right? Um, I'm not asking you to speak at for Rivercrest, us. and yeah. and uh, based on that experience and all of my experience with annexation mm -hmm. and working with schools and all kinds of uh, other kinds of development right. too, uh, I I don't. There's just no incentive for them to right. to to do that, right? And, and usually, I mean, cities as we know, are cutting budgets too, and they look sure. for every opportunity they can to bring in taxable property. Right. And the other thing here is y all the area around here is already developed. Mm -hmm. If there were a wonderful piece next to this that could be an industrial park or a retail center that could generate tax dollars, I could see them saying, well, let's bring <laughs> sewer, you know, we'll work with you, mm -hmm. we'll get sewer out there because there's more potential for us to, to bring more land in. But there really isn't here. It's large lot development. Right. I don't know, you know, that the people that live around this site would be real excited about joining you in an annexation <laughs> and coming into the city and <laughs> hooking up to the sewer. And, no. I, you know, there's a lot of issues right. like that. But right. uh, I, I just don't, I think it would be a, a very difficult process. And uh, right. I, I, I don't see any incentive for the right. city to want to do that. Right. And, and, and I agree some of the same arguments were brought up with the annexation of this property. Yep. But I mean, it's, it seemed even, you know, even doubly concerning with the fact that they may not even have the capacity, uh, which leaves us with the on-site on solution. Now, isn't there even a possibility that we couldn't do that, that, that the, the capacity we would need, uh, um, that it just simply couldn't, couldn't be done? Y yeah, the, I read the report that was done uh, and it certainly didn't sound very optimistic to me. It, right. And there were statements in there that it's not feasible, statements like it's not feasible, it doesn't fit, uh, there's, there's distance requirements, and it started showing boxes on the site where right. things right. couldn't be located. When you're dealing with sewage, I mean, there's a lot of regulations. Right. And, and the capa I mentioned the capacity. This cannot, someone had mentioned through this process about, well, couldn't we just do a great big septic system? Well, you get into certain capacities and certain types of uses, and you can't do that. I'm not an expert on that, but that was referenced in the report that this would not, a conventional septic system is not an option here. So I'm assuming those engineers were correct, and they, they know how to interpret the, the state and county codes. So uh, with that, it was left to a treatment plant. Basically, you're building a treatment plant on site, and there's a lot of regulation there. You've, there's, like I mentioned, the distances, and sure. and then there's the cost. Mm -hmm. it, it just the, the the costs in that report mm -hmm. were pretty staggering. You know, and it, running into the millions. Excuse me. Isn't it even possible that we wouldn't be permitted to build? I think the there'd be a high. From what I read there, <laughs> I think there'd be a high risk that if you go down that route and said, we're going to do this and we're gonna, we're going to we're going to do on site an on site solution, that it, it could get into an extremely long process and there would be a, a lot of risk. And I, I guess I'd defer to the engineers to, to give you more specifics on that, but that mm -hmm. would be my interpretation sure. of what I read. Right. You know, so here we, here we have a, a building, ladies and gentlemen, without, <laughs> potentially without water. And the city can't or won't or won't have the capacity to, to uh, put us online, and, and we could be between a rock and a hard place with having our own system of any kind. Uh, I mean, that, that seems just a, a huge risk. Um, uh, you know, th there's... I guess there's really not too much to recommend this. Uh, the, all the, the three points you made, I think, would, would certainly, you know, for residential development, you know, it's an attractive site, you know, some hills and trees, and, and I think the type of development that's around there uh, is the type of development that, you know, could move into this, this, mm -hmm. this parcel probably mm -hmm. successfully. But I think for a potential uh, secondary building, um, 
I mean, I, you know, unless some of my fellow board members have a different opinion, I just don't see how this works. And based upon, you know, the report that we had, we had earlier with enrollment projections, and, and, and Lynn and President Barb made the point too, we, we, we do have an urgent need, um, and that planning has to start now. And, and I think part of that planning is to really begin to aggressively look for some, for some other sites for, for a possible future secondary school. And th thanks for your report, Mark. It's very informative. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so, Mark, I agree with you, so thank you for making that point. I, I, I do think we're at a point now where we can see based on the evidence that, um, oh, I'm sorry, we can see based on the evidence that um, is in the report that this um, is likely not adequate for a secondary um, school, and so um, we'll have to uh, begin to explore other options. But one of the questions that I had that I wanted to make sure that I understood, <coughs> Mark, before we conclude this part of the agenda is, um, if, if we um, conclude that this site is not adequate for a secondary school, um, you mentioned um, perhaps it would be adequate for a smaller size school, an, an, elementary si uh, an elementary style school with a smaller student population, less traffic, et cetera. Um, would it be fair to assume, though, that if we were to use a portion of this, the acreage for an elementary school, we still would have similar grading issues? Um, and uh, we still uh, certainly have a utility cost <coughs> issue in that it's not part of the city and we would s have to find a solution to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna answer the part about the grading first um, and I'll, I'll use the exhibit that's up there right now, exhibit F. The area along Crosby, there is about 20 plus acres of what I would call usable land there and I'm gonna relate that to Rivercrest the topography on that site is probably a little more extreme than wha what was on this site. Um, I think that could be, in simple terms, I think that could be a very nice site for, a, for an elementary school. Um, and I don't, I don't think you'd have extreme costs to grade that part of the site. So then utility becomes our challenge. The utilities would be the <laughs> challenge. Uh, it, I'm trying, I, I wish I would have thought about this more before I got here. I, I was trying to think back. I, I know, I, I'm almost positive I've never done a large secondary school on any kind of on-site, with any kind of on-site solution, other than maybe a well, but not with a, not with a sewage or septic system. I don't think we've ever done a high, high school or middle school, large school with that. I think we have done some elementary schools that were in rural districts or outside of, of city limits and there was no incentive to annex it. And we've done, I think we have done some solutions. But again, it's, it's the capacity if, I mean, a, an elementary school like this with a capacity of five to 600 kids, there's a lot less sewage generated from something like that than there is something that, again, that, this report was based on the assumptions that you see at the beginning a large secondary school with up to 2,000 or around 2,000 capacity. So I think you'd have to go back to the engineering study and ask them if, if we did looked at that option, what, w what would the code say and what would the potential cost be? I can tell you I think it, there'd be a lot more possibility of doing that. Thank you very much. So I think Mark has made a recommendation um, that we um, as a board should um, have the administration begin to look for other site options for a secondary school. And I get, um, we're, we're not taking action tonight, but um, just a general sense that uh, my colleagues around this table agree that that is an appropriate next step for the administration. <coughs> yes, I'm sitting next to around this we have table. have no choice. Um, thank you. So the administration <coughs> then will take that um, as a to-do and bring that back to us as a board. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mark, very much thank for you. your work. Okay, last on the reports is the 2011 WASB uh, conference uh, delegate assembly, the resolutions. And as you, uh, you'll recall, we elected Pat to be our, um, our representative this year. And so the question to the board members is, um, assuming you've had an opportunity to read the resolutions, are there resolutions that will come before that body next week that you um, wanna offer observations or uh, comments on that they could, Pat and or the administration could then take to the conference. 
I'll just go for men in prison. I, I didn't actually parse out which ones I liked and didn't, but I would just say, by and large, I, I would endorse the resolutions proposed here. Um, there was you know, one or two that maybe uh, I wasn't in full agreement, but the vast majority of them I was. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Can I also add that um, Pat will be meeting with Tim and myself, and Sandy has also reviewed the resolutions, and we will be um, making our recommendations based on on our review of the resolutions and their impact on the district. Okay. Any other observations? No? All right. I, I have reviewed yeah. them also, and I made little comments to myself, I guess. And I, most of them make sense. I mean, most of them are. There was a couple questions asked Mary or, um, and so I, uh, they're interesting, and I guess the group was needed. So it's my first time, and I was, they make sense, so thank you, Pat. Okay. We look forward to your report when you return. Uh, we are now into topics for action. The first item on that part of the agenda is uh, the agreement with WITC for driver's education. Tim, it looks like you're going to um, Right, I'm up. That. Yeah, if you, if you recall during our 2010-11 budget uh, development and reallocation process, uh, the uh, board, uh, charge administration was coming up with a program uh, to provide driver's education uh, for students um, as we, uh, uh, as, a, as the recommendation was made to uh, eliminate the program that we have in-house. Um, we did go and do that. Uh, we issued an RFP uh, request for proposals. Uh, we, we received uh, three proposals back, one from WITC, one from Driver's Education Incorporated, and one from River City Driving. Uh, we interviewed all three of those companies. Uh, our interview team consisted of Bob Branson, who is our current driver's education instructor, uh, Laura Love, uh, Sandy Kovach, Nancy Sweet, and myself. Uh, as we went through the criteria uh, that we were looking for, uh, it became pretty, pretty apparent that WITC met uh, what we were looking for in a driver's education program. Uh, the flexibility in the offering for our students, providing a program that's here on site at the high school, uh, certainly consideration of cost for our students and our parents, um, and uh, the fact that they do use uh, our district staff. Uh, so Bob and, uh, and others will, um, if they choose, uh, will be, uh, be working with our students here. And uh, they also have a program that uh, they, they look for DPI certified staff. So that's, a, that's really a step above uh, what's required uh, if you look at the Department of Transportation uh, requirements. Uh, so that meeting those criteria, it was a pretty unanimous decision uh, for the team to recommend WITC uh, to provide the program. And, uh, and that is what they'll do. They, they will take the program, they'll provide the information, do the classes, do the behind the wheel, provide the vehicles. So they do the whole nine yards. Uh, school district will uh, provide some classroom space to, to accommodate that. And uh, so it's our recommendation uh, that the uh, board approve WI the contract with WITC for driver's education. Are there questions? Um, to, I, I did have one as I went through the agreement, um, as you know, the, the dates um, caught my attention and I, I think you're ready to clarify why the dates right. in the agreement are stipulated in the way that they are. Right, and that's, that's really a, a WITC deal. Uh, they've got to issue one contract for the, for the remainder of the fiscal year here and that's, that shows that the district's committed to working with them. Uh, that allows them to move forward to uh, staff a program, provide uh, equipment and materials, and, um, and then as we work through, we'll move forward to work through with them to transition uh, from our program to theirs during the, the remainder of the school year. Uh, Mr. Branson, of course, will remain uh, in the classroom teaching and doing behind the wheel all, as all of that happens. So. And that's why the, the terms of the agreement are a dollar. Yes, that, that's great. And that's yeah, another requirement of theirs. So, yeah. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, so if there are no other questions, I will take a motion to approve this agreement. 
Madam President, I move to approve the agreement with WITC for driver's education program. Motion by Lynn. I second it. Second by Pat. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, uh, we are now into the consent agenda items. If uh, one of you would be willing to make the motion and include the amount of the disbursements. Madam President, I move to approve the consent agenda, including that the Director of Financial Services be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $1,198,612.16. Motion by Lynn. Second. Second by Dan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Committee reports. Um, first on the agenda, Dan Chernohoy, you are going to do the Finance Committee report in Brian's absence. Okay, thank you. Um, Finance Committee met, <coughs> excuse me, on January 3rd. Um, the topics that we discussed were the driver's education program that uh, the committee uh, approved and sent to the board. Uh, the other item that we spent a little more time with is we had the independent auditing firm Larson Allen. They have an office in Hudson and uh, Tom Cordes, I believe, is the rep that we met with. Um, and he reviewed the, the audit, the financials from the previous fiscal year. Um, and for the most part, the financials are in good shape. And um, so the finance committee was pleased with, with that report. Um, I think the committee is going to continue to take a look at that report. I don't think we com completed our discussion on it. So I think there are a few things that we're going to pick up at one of the upcoming meetings. And then there was a item on the agenda related to uh, student transportation research and we, we did not take that up at that meeting. So any Thank questions? You. Um, I did have one question, which is, as it relates to the um, audited financials, will the full board have access to that at some point, or only by request, only by special request? <laughs> yes, those reports are on their way out. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, you'll receive them right after the meeting. <laughs> Um, so the next committee, uh, actually the next two committee reports, um, Mark, you'll be taking both facilities and grounds followed by personnel? Yes, I will, Madam President. I've got both of them. Um, the, uh, both those committees met last week. Uh, the first was the facilities and grounds committee. Uh, first up on the agenda, we dealt with the <laughs> leafy spurge issue. Uh, I got quite an education on this. Uh, for those <laughs> not in the know like I am now, a leafy spurge is an invasive uh, weed. Um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty much pervasive all around the country, but there's lots of areas of Wisconsin that are being overtaken by this. It drives out native vegetation. And the DNR has requested that um, Hudson help them out. There's been a lot of areas around here that have been identified with leafy spurge, including the before mentioned uh, UU property. And the um, remedy for this, um, in, I guess in June, we'll be getting a delivery of bugs, special bugs that, um, I forgot what they're, but they're bugs to me, some <laughs> particular insect that lives on and only leafy spurge. Uh, and these have been used uh, for quite a number of years now, I forget exactly, so they are, you know, they're safe, you don't have to worry, they, they just eat leafy spurge and, and make it go away. So we're on the list, um, I guess right now there's uh, quite a demand for bugs, I don't know where we are on the list, but let's keep our fingers crossed that we get our bugs in June. So, all right. Uh, next, we had a, uh, a middle school addition uh, construction update by, I, by Tim Erickson. Uh, everything's going well uh, on budget and uh, on schedule. Um, and just as an aside here, I, I really want to, you know, uh, uh, single out both Mr. Erickson and uh, Mr. Stasco for their involvement in this project. You know, saying something that's on time and under budget, um, we, we've come to almost expect that as, that <coughs> as being the norm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a government project. So, I, you know, say no more. Um, and so these guys have done really a, a terrific job at, at, at keeping this project on time, under budget. And there have been challenges, not the least of which has been the weather over this last month or two. So I really think these two gentlemen, des you know, deserve a, a fair measure of credit for that. Um, and, and last up, we had a closed session um, uh, for the purpose of delivering about the sale and or purchase of public properties. Could I just make a comment, um, Meg, be careful on the bugs part, but, um, you know, it sounds kind of strange, but it is uh, 
supported by the DNR. It's it's supported by uh, at the national level as USDA. well, yeah. and has been used for uh, numerous years. Uh, we actually uh, the the uh, DNR has been using them on the I-94 corridor um, and in our local area. So um, we won't be the only site. Right. <laughs> Okay, and also that same evening, the uh, personnel committee met, and the only item on the agenda uh, was a closed session uh, for the purpose of uh, confidential uh, employee issues. Okay, thank you, Mark. Are there any other questions for Mark? All right, um, are there any citizens' requests to speak, Diane? One. We have a request to speak from Ken, I'm going to take a stab, Reimer. Uh, Ken, if you could come forward to the microphone and introduce yourself and give us your address. And Ken is going to speak to us about the, HUD, the high school bowling club. Yep. My name is Ken Reimer. I'm actually from Baldwin, Wisconsin. I am originally from Hudson. And um, about two and a half years ago, uh, I brought can, my kids. I'm going to pause you and, and ask you to actually state your address. Oh, and then state you my address? I'm sorry. Uh, I live at 1386 Mallard Avenue in Baldwin, Wisconsin. Um, I grew up in this area pretty much all my life, so I know the area pretty well. Um, about two and a half years ago, I took over the uh, position as youth coordinator with junior bowling. And uh, they, had a, they had a guy that was running a high school program, which we'd be bowling against other high schools. And uh, they'd have an opportunity to go to state and all that. Um, what we're trying to do is, as an organization, trying to make it for the children of the high school to get as a club where they can get recognized through the yearbook and, and whatnot through the school. Um, because right now I've got seven, seven boys on, my, uh, vars on a varsity team right now that we travel to Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls, Chittack. Um, so we do travel. Um, I'm not looking for any money because uh, everything is through donations, sponsorships, and children's fees. So, and basically, a total cost for us to get involved with the children is $300 per team. A team consists of up to a maximum of 10 people. 10, 10 kids, so, and what I'm trying to do is, for each team, you know, it's $300, so I'm looking at two varsities and two JV teams, so it'd be um, $1,200, but everything's done by sponsorships and, and uh, donations, and the kids actually have to pay a $20 participation fee, that way I get a commitment through my kids saying, I'm going to do this. Okay. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate yep. it. What, what I would encourage you to do, Ken, is actually take your request to the athletic director we here did. in the school district. And she's, she was told that she was going to bring it to the board here, and that's the reason why I was here. <laughs> um, I believe there are a few steps before that occurs. Okay. And she just told me that that's because my wife just had the meeting in December. She said, all she told us, so I'll bring it up to the board in January, and that's kind of why I'm here. <laughs> Well, I was hoping she was going to speak on behalf of it, so I didn't have to. So she has your contact information, I'm Correct. assuming. And we'll make sure that she gets back to you and clarifies what the next steps are, because there's some steps that occur before oh, okay. that. There See, is a procedure that we okay. go through that's been yeah, identified to recognize a new sport. Okay. Otherwise, because I know WIA doesn't recognize it as a sport yet, and that's why well, we're trying to get it through as a club instead due to the fact that it's not recognized in the state of Wisconsin, even though it was founded in Wisconsin. And, okay. <laughs> and Minnesota has actually got it as a sport, so, but we're trying to get it as a club. That way, the kids get recognition through our school, you know, saying, hey, I got an accomplishment or something. Plus, there's millions and millions of dollars in just scholarships for these kids to uh, even try for. We, we appreciate your visit, Ken, and um, again, as Mary said, we'll make sure that uh, Ms. DeVos gets back to you to help 
um, explain what the process would be for you to go through okay. um, yeah. to have that done here. Unfortunately, she just told us this part. <laughs> I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that that um, <laughs> about that communication. So that's okay. Thank you. As Thank long you as you guys know about it. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, we are at that point in the agenda where we are going to adjourn to a closed session. We will not be returning to an open session, so we will leave um, uh, the, uh, the auditorium um, after this motion is made. If there is a board member who would uh, be willing to make that motion, reading the language. Madam Madam President, um, I'll make a motion to adjourn to closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85, parent 1B and Parent 1F for preliminary consideration of specific personnel problem and for preliminary consideration of non-renewal of an employee and E for the purpose of deliberating about the sale and or purchase of public properties. So the motion by Dan, is there a second? Second. Second by Mark. We'll do a roll call vote. Robson, aye. Kaiser shot aye. Chernohoy, aye. Van Loon, aye. German, aye. We are adjourned.